It is. No, it's no. on the second one. That's the big oh. one. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to Bay Kai. Um, I guess the, the first meeting of the new decade. And um, it's always interesting for me to ask how many people have never been to a Bay Kai before. Can, can you raise your hand? Okay, so it's about, mm, that's probably about a third. Maybe that's uh, pretty good. Um, tonight, uh, I want to give a, a couple of heads up on things that are happening soon. Tomorrow night, the, um, the eye scanning boff, Birds of a Feather, is uh, getting together. There's details about that on uh, the website. In two weeks from tomorrow night, um, a professor from uh, King University in Toronto is giving uh, an interesting talk on uh, those people who are planning at some point in their life to have locked-in syndrome. Uh, it's a, eye scanning as a data entry uh, interface. And so, uh, you know, you could look smarter than Stephen Hawking if, uh, if the UI were better. Um, now, before the speakers talk, I wanted Nancy, our chair, to just do a five-minute dance. Thanks, Paul. Some of you may have heard of the format called Ignite uh, or Pachacucha, and this is a format that was used on Saturday as the close of an event called Community Leadership Summit, and I presented about Bay Kai, and I thought this would be instructive for all of us uh, to get a chance to see, because I was introducing Bay Kai to a whole bunch of other community organizations. So I'm going to try to do it. Um, I want to reflect tonight on 20, more than 20 years of activity of Bay Kai, which is an all-volunteer run organization that you may or may not know a lot about. And uh, we've, we, ha well, so you want to know what is Bay Kai? Bay Kai is the Association for Computing Machineries local chapter, the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of its special interest group on computer-human interaction. That's a mouthful. We have about 5,000 uh, people on our mailing list and about 800 members currently. And our earliest volunteer is Don Patterson, who was one of the founders. He says, serve the people is the key to creating a great organization, and the money will follow. Don't try to build the money first. Carrie Carpenter, who is a newer member of Bay Kai and volunteer says, the great services that Bay Kai offers are reach way beyond this organization. She got the notices about the job bank before she moved to the Bay Area. Fred, who's sitting down front, has been a volunteer for a long time, and he says, include everyone. Don't worry about what your job title, your background, preparation, or employment status is. Our monthly um, meetings like this one cover topics of all sorts. Diane Boros, who's somewhere up in there. Hi, Diane. She has said that engaging people is what makes a community. So we keep trying new methods to engage with all of the people who are interested in us. Tutorials that have been successful in the international meetings come to Bay Kai from time to time. Many of you may know Mr. Bay Kai, Richard Anderson. Lots of people didn't know his name for a long time because he was the chair for 12 years of these meetings and kept forgetting to introduce himself. So when people greeted him on the street, they'd say, oh, you're Mr. Bay Kai. Uh, some of you have seen Steve outside, Steve Williams, is, says, we govern by consensus. And his paraphrase of another person says, either everyone agrees or the majority agree that the minority are being disagreeable. <laughs> Stacy Habino, where are you, Stacy? Hey, she says, we have to expect change. We've had lots of changes over the years in governance and topics that we're interested in, formats for our meeting. Stacy and Rashmi Sinha were very instrumental in organizing the first unconference in 2006. Um, Howie is not in the audience, I don't think, this afternoon. He says, if you volunteer for Bay, Bay Kai, you can participate immediately. He went from saying, I want to volunteer, to taking notes right away. Lucy Dobler it, took over from Van, whom some of you may know, and she is the, currently our BOF chair. That's birds of a feather. Those are subspecialties within the Bay Kai organization. And she learned a lot from Van how to support them. And as Paul mentioned, the eye tracking group is very active this month. Van, whom I hope you all get a chance to meet, he organized the thing over the weekend, says regular face-to-face -face meetings is what helps us um, solidify and keep ourselves together. We can do a lot of work online and via electronic means, but do those face-to-face -face meetings too. 
Claudia, raise your hand and wave. Yeah, okay. She says, promote the practice. She got introduced to Baykai from Mitchell Gass, another longtime volunteer and a perpetual Baykai advocate. He said, come to the Baykai meetings, and she says, wow, I'm interested in design. These are amazing, perfect meetings. I'm going to give Steve another chance to speak up because he's a big advocate of open, open source content. And Steve is... Um, putting, helping all of us to put our monthly meetings that we've got in the can for the last four years on the web through Conversations Networks. Mary Van Riper, hey Mary, way in the back, has been the co-chair of the Usability Engineering BOF, remember you heard about BOFs before, for 11 years. And she welcomes everybody at those meetings and works with other people as her co-chair. Andrew Wong has been a volunteer at Baykai, and he says, I only volunteered for a couple of years. I attended programs, volunteered, and made a career transition supported by Baykai. I used to be a graphic designer, and now I'm a web designer and a human interface advocate. I love the phrase, only a few years, right? Um, Ellen Franchick was one of our earlier chairs, and she comes back from time to time. She says, recruit for your position a replacement 20% sooner than you think you might need to. Naranjan is our postmaster currently, and he has found out that everybody participates in the steering of Baykai, who becomes, everybody who becomes a volunteer, and that's how Baykai becomes successful. And I will say of myself that I feel like I've gotten a second graduate degree by being part of Baykai. I learned all these new ideas over the past 20 years. I was a member from 1991, longtime member, first time volunteer, stepped right into the chair's role. You can follow in my footsteps. So what is Baykai? We operate by, by a volunteer status, and we are regularly refreshed with new participants. And um, this slide deck only uh, includes about 16 of the many, many, probably several hundred volunteers who have worked with us over the years. Thank you. <laughs> and let me get out of here and let the next speaker up. So our second, our first speaker of the evening is Julie Melton. She was. Um, she told me she started her career in 2000 in Boston. I guess her first client was Harvard Law School, and she worked for Harvard Business School. Some people might know Photo.net, which is um, you know a premier photography site, and she worked on the redesign of the UI there. She came out here about two and a half years ago. Um, she's currently um, set up her own research group, Deluxify. And she's got clients all over the world. Um, tonight, she's going to be speaking about remote user testing. And um, if you're ready. I'm going to just, well, I'll leave this until after okay. she's done. Okay. Uh, I'll just keep talking for a minute so that Julie can make sure that her slides are up. Um, is there anything that I should reveal about Julie that I haven't already said? I, I don't think so. Hi. Thank you for a. Uh, I need to turn my thing on. It's on? It's on? Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming out on a Tuesday night um, and spending an hour here with me learning about remote research. Um, we're going to talk about hows, what's, and whys of remote research and also ask you guys to think about how you might be doing remote research. So, in the um, talk description, we warned that it would be workshop style. That means that you guys have to be thinking too. So if you have anything to take notes on or you want to take out your laptop, feel free. Um, because we will have a couple times where we'll pause, then we'll pause and I'll ask you to do some thinking on your own and we'll do some sharing as well. So first of all, what do we, what do we mean by remote research? It's, it's basically studying people who are not in the same room with you. So this means not lab research, not face-to-face -face in a conference room research. So we're using screen sharing software, recording software, and phones to communicate with people who are remote from us. So basically, I drew this. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a moderator and a participant. They're talking on the phone. They're both looking at their computers. They could be anywhere doing this. You can have as many observers as you want you know, from, from your team. This is another really nice thing about remote research is that you're not limited by um, capacity, with how many people you have who are basically sitting in on the study, which is nice. You might be in different time zones. You might be, have different native languages. 
Um, so this really kind of changes the game when it comes to the logistics of doing research, and it changes some of the ways of how you run a study, research methodology. So let's, let's see a show of hands. So who here has participated in some kind of face-to-face -face user research study? All right, so how many of you have done this in a, on a remote basis? Um, I'm gonna call, okay, someone brave, shout out something about your research study. I wanna know difficulties and, and big wins. No travel costs. All right, so you said that was a big win is no travel costs? We, <coughs> no, we'd like to record tool. the audience participation. So ah, so okay, so. we're gonna ask you to say that again. Easier to sell the best of stakeholders on your results if they were listening in. Hold on. We're getting there. Okay, so let's hear okay. your, your, your Yeah, I was saying uh, no travel costs. The, uh, we're consultants and very few of our uh, clients these days, especially 2009, mm -hmm. not be a good year, don't want to pay for travel costs. Travel for themselves, travel for participants. So we do remote. Okay. Um, what were your biggest challenges? You lose the immediacy of being able to observe the environment. Uh, we've actually even done um, contextual inquiry mm -hmm. remotely, and I'm sure there are people here cringing, but, you know, it's a compromise. Mm -hmm. You can't videotape their office and point to the calendar saying, what does this do? And right. But you can still get a good sense of what they're doing, at least with their system, if you're doing WebEx or something like that. Okay, so Let's a more... Get a webcam, you can see their faces. Okay, so kind of a more efficient way of doing contextual inquiry then in a way, then you might. I, I would say it's a compromise resources. of budget versus uh, complete yep. um, environment. Okay. It was easier to get the the uh, buy-in from the rest of, from the stakeholders mm -hmm. about the results of the research because they had been listening and watching at the time mm. that the users were uh, doing the interactions. Okay, what was your biggest challenge? I would say the biggest challenge was uh, the, having the, the users connect through the software to mm. get everything started so that the actual research experience could begin. Okay, so the, the sort of technical setup. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, let's hear one more. Uh, I'd say biggest challenge is getting computer A and computer B talking to one another, particularly mm -hmm. if there's a firewall involved. Okay. And um, the one of the big benefits to me is it's easier to take notes if I'm not having to uh, maintain eye contact with the person or something like that. Okay. And your biggest challenge? Uh, the firewall and the getting computers talking That's to one right. another. That's right. Okay. Okay. So as we've seen, there are some pretty significant benefits and also pretty significant challenges as well for doing remote research. Um, so let's, let's do some thinking about why you might want to go remote and why you might not want to go remote, first of all, as we begin to sort of frame our thoughts about this. So first of all, I'm going to do some selling to you about remote research. Um, years of recruiting is a big one. I don't think anyone likes recruiting. It's not fun. Um, it takes a lot of time. It can be really hard to find people who are willing to take the time to travel to a location to, to meet with you. It also takes time to figure out when you could go meet them in their space, for example. Uh, also recruiting quality. I mean, this is something I've done a lot of thinking about because I've done a lot of research studies in San Francisco. And the, the people who have free time during the day that can like hang out in SOMA at your office, are, it, it didn't necessarily match the people who are pro product is targeting at all. And so it, it, we were just really limited by our, um, our pool of, of possible participants, basically. So at that point, if you're really scrambling to find people, you're just going to accept whoever you can find. Basically, you're just, it's much more limiting. If you have a much, much broader pool, because it requires less time for people to participate, and you're accessing people outside of your town, um, you can get the right people for what you're looking for much more easily. And although we don't see their real physical environment, we do see their real computer environment. 
which if you're doing a lab-based test, you don't. And so we're going to look at a, at a case a little bit later on where seeing a participant's computer was actually really helpful and interesting, that we, and we wouldn't have had that context otherwise. So if you're asking someone to come into a lab setting, they're using this machine they might not be used to using. Um, you're, you're asking them to learn a lot of new things, and especially if you're doing some sort of usability test. It's hard to kind of parse out what's there being uncomfortable with the new setup and what's your tool working or not working correctly. And again, what we said about no limit to the number of observers. You can have a lot of people jump in and out. Um, it's not disruptive to have them enter and leave. And they can communicate with you still by using IM, for example. I found it's the best way to do that. Um, and we'll do some talking about real-time recruiting. So that's intercepting people as they're using a website, asking them to fill out a screener, giving them a call right then. We'll be talking more about that. But in that case, you're using actual tasks. You're not saying, um, pretend you want to buy some sneakers. Say, hey, you're buying some sneakers. Can we tag along as you do that? So it ends up being a, a much more authentic task, which can be more useful. But caveats. If you are testing people who don't have good internet access, then you're going to have a you're going to have a bad time, right? So you need people basically who are using broadband, and also folks who are on wireless. Also, they might not be able to you know talk on the phone at the same time that they are on the internet. That's obviously not going to work. So you're you're kind of limiting your participant base to people who are somewhat tech savvy already, um, and also you don't see their faces. You know, this is. This feels more important, though, than it actually is. I mean, once you, like, there's so much that's, con that's conveyed through voice that in the end, after so many studies that I've worked on remotely, that's something that a lot of my colleagues have noted is like, oh, well, maybe we didn't really need to see their face. But that is sort of an upfront concern. And just a note about webcams. Not everyone has them, first of all, and for people that do, it adds complexity. You know, it adds this other level of things that could go wrong or things to worry about may not be worth it. And also, there's the kind of creepiness factor of, well, what's actually happening here? And what are they looking at? And it, it might be worth it. I found that in, in my case, I've never found a case when it has been useful to use webcams. Time zones. This is fun. You really need to make sure that you um, know the time zone of the person that you're talking to when you're doing scheduled remote testing. Um, I had a case where I had an intern in London who was scheduling calls with someone in Oregon, and she didn't, like, something about the dateline was confusing, and, and it was just, um, it ended up being on the wrong day, you know, that I called the person. And luckily, they, they had free time that day, and they were like, ah, oh, I can talk anyway, that's fine. But it, it can be really tricky when you're dealing with datelines, when you're dealing with time zones that are half an hour off. Um, and places that don't change for daylight savings or do change. So there are lots of good websites that you can go to for matching up cities and seeing what time zone someone else is in. And it's good to just verify that up front with them and make sure that everyone has the same expectation. Mobile. If you figured out a way to do remote research with mobile devices, please tell me. Um, that's something I've been doing a lot of thinking about and trying to figure out, and I haven't cracked it yet. So if you have, um, let me know. Right now, it's just basically browser to browser on a PC. So also, if you, if you have some kind of work that's fairly secret, the kind of thing that you'd want someone to sign an NDA for, um, you might not want to have this accessible to them on their machine where they, I mean, assume that anything that someone sees, they can take a screenshot of. So if that gives you the heebie-jeebies, then you shouldn't do remote testing. And also thinking about consent. You know, if you're talking to kids, if you're talking to minors, you, you have to get consent for having them in your study, and that can be a little tricky. So it's something that you should just really think about and think about how you would get consent from their parents or guardians in, in order for them to participate in your study. So I think you should go remote if, um, if you can share what you're studying. So if it's OK that if they grab a screenshot of this, and send it to Mashable, it won't be sad for you. Um, if you don't have easy access to your target users already, so I mean, if I 
were wanting to study um, Rails developers in their native environment, it would be really silly for me to do remote research if I'm working in SOMA, right? Because there are so many people who do that, I can very easily go and see what they're doing. Or if I'm in Antarctica and I'm studying how Antarctic researchers are using some computer system, I should just go there, right, and see how they're doing this. Um, so again, mobile is tough to do with remote. And then if you're not working with miners, um, it's a, that's just a consideration. OK, so your first exercise. Think about what big questions your organization is facing right now. And think about how you're addressing those big challenges right now, what kind of research you're doing, or maybe you're not doing any research for those. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to kind of get your thoughts down, because we're going to revisit this later. So start. Nancy, you're not writing? No, I've memorized my questions. Okay. My answers are questions. <laughs> OK, does anyone need more time? OK, it looks like you don't. All right, so let's come back. All right, let's have one person share. Stand up if you're brave. And we don't all have to sign an NDA. To be able to tell us about this. Right. One person. Oh, come on. There we go. This is, is this on? OK, this is a an old problem. I don't work at the organization anymore, but I was a marketer at Intuit, and I managed partnerships that were uh, partnering with Quicken.com. And so we would design the websites, and how we would measure success is post-design with click-through conversion, stuff like that. So. I'm wondering if we could have gotten ahead of the curve and if with remote research, see how things worked before we implemented. Does that make sense? What so I'm trying to say? It, it, like you, you just didn't feel like you were using the best research method for what you were looking at? I'm sorry, could you so say that? You, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So you, you said that you might not have been using like the right research method for what you were trying so to understand? So we would put our heads together and we would design based on what we thought was good. Okay. So, and then we would, I as a marketer would measure success by the business and like click through and conversions and stuff like that. So if we did more remote research, we would have more information up front on okay, if the so design you're, so you're, was working. So your big problem then was just sort of understanding general success of the product? Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's get into how to do remote research. So we're going to go through some different components here. We're going to dive, uh, get a little specific. There are places where I'm not going to be extremely specific just because it would be really boring and there's more available online. So basically, this is intended as a way to, to point you to different places where you can go and get really specific. Um, so let's talk about project components. I mean, a lot of these are exactly the same as what you'd have for an in-person study. You need, you need some people, you need a participant, you need a moderator, you may or may not have observers, you need tasks, you need, some, you know, you need something that you're actually going to study, you need a computer on which to do this. Um, remote testing adds a few complexities in that there's another computer thrown into the mix, which is the participant's computer over which you have no control. Um, 
your ability to access the internet, your participants' ability to access the internet, um, installing screen sharing software. So your participants' ability to download a plugin to be able to run screen sharing software. Um, the moderator and the observers communicating with each other using IM. You can also use um, uh, the, the IM like chat function that's basically built into screen sharing. But I found that so often those permission settings are so wonky that really bad things can happen if the participant sees that or whatever. I mean, I think it's just better to sort of stay out of that space entirely. Um, so it's basic, it's more complex. There's more up front for you to think about as you're running a study. So we're gonna break this out. Another thing that you have to think about is scheduling. So we're going to be talking mostly about scheduled and moderated tests today, but you can also do non-scheduled moderated tests and non-scheduled and non-moderated tests. We're gonna go into each of these and explain the differences between those. So with, when you have a scheduled and moderated test, that's basically you arrange with the participants to talk at a set time. You call them at whatever the equivalent of 2 p.m. is tomorrow. Um, with non-scheduled moderated tests, that's when you do a website intercept. Um, and when you do non-scheduled, non-moderated, that's using one of these new online services to be able to run a research study where you just plug in a set of questions and people come in and answer them and you're, you're sort of removed from the process. So if you're scheduling tests and you're moderating those, um, there are some definite pros here. One is you don't need access to your code, which you do if you're doing a, a non-scheduled moderated test. Um, I found that it's really the easiest transition from in-person studies because it, it feels the same to other people within the organization. Oh, we're doing a user test at three o'clock today, you know, rather than we're going to just be um, finding people off the website and hopefully we can on this day. A, a, a definite con is that tasks aren't necessarily authentic. You know, you're sort of asking people to visualize, imagine that they're doing something. And there, there are definitely ways that you can do that um, reasonably well, how you can add time constraints, how you can really think about how to make that task feel authentic, but it's not authentic. You know, it's not what they were, would have been doing anyway at that point, probably. Um, and then also scheduling. Scheduling takes time. You have to figure out when people are free, you have to verify those times, and that's, that's time. That's your time or that's someone else's time to do that. So, again, we have, these are the people involved in the study. You have your moderator, probably. You have your observers, probably. It's the participants that you really need to think about how you get them in there. And when you're doing recruiting for a scheduled remote test, it's really similar to how you would do this for an in-person test. So you can think about the ways that you already recruit. Um, some things that I've done that have been pretty successful is running house ads. So within your site, running ads to say, hey, you know, sign up and do our test, whatever. Um, event websites, I've used upcoming.org, for example, as a way to get people in for doing testing. Customer lists, if you're doing testing of current customers, you probably have some information about people who are already current customers and you can, it can reach them. Um, I've done this through, you know, whenever you send out a newsletter or any kind of regular spamming that you do of your lists, you can include a little line about, hey, we value your opinion and we want you to do the study with us, which also makes it look nice because it looks like you care at that point. Um, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of recruiting on Twitter, which has worked really, really well, actually. So that's another option. Another one, Mechanical Turk, um, and I'm going to wave to Bryn in the audience because she's an expert on Mechanical Turk. So I, I've had great luck with using Mechanical Turk for recruiting. For a study that we're going to look at a little bit later, uh, we sent out a survey to hundreds of Mechanical Turkers, and from that, cut that along certain types of, of attributes and behaviors that we thought would be interesting with people we, that we wanted to talk to. And then with those people we went and we scheduled um, moderated user tests with and then provided them an additional incentive to do that component as well. Um, really easy to find people and it just made the process much more smooth. A downside to that is that if you want to reach like Fortune 500 CEOs, chances are they're not going to be on Mechanical Turk. You know, they, they have better things to do with their time than, than that. So, and you're also going to, again, find people who are pretty tech savvy and 
are know about it and are using it. So think about that as another option, though, that's really valuable. So in thinking about scheduling, first you kind of want to make sure that they're the right person for you. And one way that I've done that is to set up a really basic survey in SurveyMonkey or whatever to collect some basic information from them. You want time zone. You want what city they're in. Um, it's a great time to ask about age, because that's a little awkward to talk about in person, but everyone's happy to like fill it in a box, even though they don't want to tell you face to face, which is weird. Um, name for your own record is good to have if they're willing to share it. Email address and phone number. And if they're able to install a plugin on their computer. Some people don't know. Um, but it's nice to know. Also, if they've used any kind of screen sharing software before. I mean, chances are whatever they've used is not necessarily what you're going to use, but at least it helps you understand their kind of level of savviness in general and their comfort with it. And also, information that you can refer back to. So be sure in your email to say your name and what company you're with. And then when you give them a call, you can say, oh, hey there. This is you know, Julie. I'm calling from blah company. And then they can, can connect that with the email. So just make sure there's enough about you so they know that when you call them, you're not a crazy person and they'll talk to you. Audio. So this is really the most important piece, is to be able to talk to the person at the other end of the line. Um, again, lots of ways to do this. I found that the, the easiest, most foolproof way is for you, the moderator, to be calling on Skype to a mobile or landline. And that way, you can record Skype through your machine. And it's much cheaper to make international calls that way. Skype to Skype is cheaper, but I have never had good luck with that in terms of getting good audio quality. Your results may vary, but um, I haven't found it to work very well. I've had to actually call people back on a different line when we've tried to do that before. Um, get a good quality headset, you know, one that you're comfortable wearing and that's going to record audio that works well enough to be able to use it later. Um, another option, if you have the time and the resources, is to set up a patch on your phone, which takes some time, it takes some investment and resources, but it's not that hard. And then you have much better quality of audio that's being recorded. So a second component is screen sharing. Now, note that not every study needs this. There can be times when you just want to be doing an interview. You don't want to be talking to someone. You don't necessarily have anything to show them. But basically, any kind of regular old screen sharing tool that you know of or that you use at work already will work. So WebEx, Adobe Connect, GoToMeeting, um, LiveLook, there's probably something that your organization already has um, installed or has access to. So you maybe just go to that first. But if you do this on your own, um, Adobe kind of hides their free version, and they try to make you pay a lot for the pro version. You don't need the pro version. That's if you have like 200 people on the line, and you probably won't. So hunt around to get the, the free version of Connect. So when you're actually recording this on your computer to be able to look back at later and to share with people, um, differs by Mac and PC. On Mac, there's a great program called I Show You HD, which in combination with Soundflower, which is a tool that allows you to pull off data from your um, audio stream. You're able to pull together the audio from a Skype, whatever is showing on your screen that's being shared with this other person. Um, and then it packages the, all that together and syncs it up really nicely. It can be a little clunky to get all these pieces together. Um, I did a ton of fiddling to get all the settings and everything working correctly. So if you're interested, if you go to my blog, juliemelton.com, I have a really long list of every, t every slider that you slide and button that you click and all of that. So feel free to use that and share that, whatever. I'm, that's, I found that to be useful. On the PC, there's this great program called User View, which does all of that. All of these little pieces that we have to do on the Mac are available on the PC with User View, but they discontinued it last year. So I don't know. I don't know what the future holds in this space, but um, maybe someone will resurrect it, which would be nice. What is it? Glance.net. Glance? Sorry, Glance.net. Is that PC or Mac or both? I think it's both. I certainly know it's PC. Great. All right. Glance.net. Awesome. Thank you. 
Okay, so when, you, when you're moderating a remote test, it can actually be really tricky to do. And there are some things that are different from how you would do moderation for an in-person test. So first of all, you want to introduce yourself. Um, be as non-creepy as you can. So, you know, super friendly and nice and explain right up front who you are and why you're calling so that they know. Um, and then you want to help them install, like right away, you want to help them install whatever plugin they need to do this. It's helpful if you send that ahead of time in an email. So then you can refer back to that email or you can send them another one where you can go and install um, the Connect plugin or whatever, whatever other software you're using for screen sharing. Um, and then also, before you hit the record button, get their approval. Just say, you know, any sort of standard line you have about, we're recording this so that we don't have to take as many notes. We're not going to you know, share this on YouTube. Is it OK if we record this? Um, I've never had anyone say no. So here, here's a trick that I'm sharing with you that I honed through a lot of practice as a way to start off the conversation. Say, it's a little weird doing this and not being able to see each other. Could you just tell me a bit about yourself, where you live, how old you are, and the kind of work that you do? Um, again, if you didn't collect their age on the, the form. So this is very calculated. So by saying right up front, hey, it's a little weird we're doing this, it's a way of recognizing to them that, OK, you probably don't do this every day. If you're feeling kind of awkward about this, that's OK. It's weird. Um, it puts people at ease when you say that. It also makes you seem more human to them. And when you ask them to tell a bit about themselves, they sort of tell their narrative. You know, They tell their story, which is really different from uh, you interrogating them and asking them like you're checking things off a form. It starts the conversation off much more nicely. And um, again, asking people how old they are, when I've done that, they've been like, uh, 47? You know, just like in a, in a way that makes it seem like I, I committed a taboo by asking that, right? So think about how to pull that into other things. And it's interesting what people choose to say about themselves, right? I mean, that can be really interesting too. So let them have a chance to kind of show who they are as a person. And then you can show who you are as a person too, right? I mean, say where you're calling from, what your name is. And then you, you sort of make that connection between these are two people talking. Um, and it makes the rest of the, the process much easier. Some other things that are the same is you know, if you're doing a usability test in person, you probably have some line about, we're testing the website. We're not testing you. So you're not going to be doing anything wrong. Um, we're not going to leave here saying, wow, she really had a hard time doing da da da. We're going to leave here saying, wow, we need to fix that to make it easier to use. So how, whatever way that you put participants at ease about the process, you want to do the same thing here. And then also making it clear that you're listening. So if you stay too silent, then sometimes you know, someone will go on for a while, and, and then they'll stop and say, oh, are you still there? You know, so ways that you can show that you're still on the line, like, mm-hmm, or, oh, OK. I mean, think about whatever the vocal equivalent would be to like looking intently and nodding thoughtfully. Think of how you would do that in an auditory way. And it could be that you have to make yourself do that and really think about it. Of course, still, you know, respect the participant's time. I mean, the same as you would with a regular study. If things get really interesting at the end and you would like to keep talking, um, ask their permission to keep going or not. And then also, if you're doing this in an office environment and you're in the conference room, may, maybe hang up a sign or something on the door so people don't barge in and try to kick you out to have their meeting. I mean, they need to know that you are in a testing session. And that space needs to be respected in the same way that it would be if someone were right there. Because it's really awkward to say on the phone to someone like, oh, hold on. <laughs> I'll be right back. I and mean, that just it, it, it can throw things off a little bit. So, Make sure that people around you are, are respecting what you're doing. Some pro tips. So if you're using I Show You HD, it has a nice little timer that counts how long you've been recording. Um, I like to make sure that I move that little timer into the recording frame so that as I record, um, it's easy to go back to that recording. And it's sort of like an instant time marker that's really easy to see. Uh, also, sometimes I sort of stretch the recording frame to include uh, uh, a text file. So I can be taking notes that are then recorded in sync with whatever's happening on the screen, whatever's happening um, on the phone. It just pulls everything together more nicely than it would be if those notes were in a file that you'd have to refer back to along with the video. Um, also, when you're sharing the video, really think carefully about what you want to share to stakeholders. 
you don't want to just say, you, you might want to, you know, you want to give them access to, but you might not want to expect them to watch six hours of video. You know, so if you pull out the most interesting bits and share those in one place, uh, that can be super helpful. And I'm going to keep coming back to this, but give yourself a lot of setup time. There are a lot of moving pieces here. Something will go wrong. Um, you want to make sure that that goes wrong while you have time to fix it and not when you have someone on the phone with you. So make sure that you have everything set up for the first time way in advance. You want to test it on your colleagues first. You know, you want to have your um, buddy down the hall test this with you before you ever do this with a real participant. And then before you get a real participant on the phone, you want to make sure you have it set up with enough time to be able to do a test run with your setup before you get on the phone with them. Otherwise, um, it could be tough. And even then, you're, you're going to have problems. I, I promise you will have problems. You will have problems in a significant percentage of the, the sessions that you do. Because there's so many moving pieces, right? So first of all, be apologetic. You know, be really nice about it. Um, I had a participant once who was talking to me from the small island off the coast of Sweden where he lived where they were having bad weather, and so the internet wasn't working very well. And so we were talking on Skype, and it was just really impossible to hear. And so we rescheduled for the next week. And you know, he was fine with that. He was nice about it. I was also really nice about it. Um, and it was fine. It wasn't the kind of thing that we could do anything about. But it's also the kind of thing we couldn't plan for. You, know, you can't expect for bad weather in Sweden, necessarily. Well, maybe you can. Um, but just recognize that it can happen. And if you can reschedule, reschedule with them and increase the incentive amount if you are able to, just to show that you appreciate their flexibility. Um, sometimes it won't work. No matter what you try, you're, there's going to be a problem with installation, with network access, with something. And that will happen, and it's OK. It does, it does happen. But try to think of what you can get from that session. I mean, even if you can't, even if screen sharing isn't necessarily working terribly well, maybe you just do a phone call with them. You know, you, you, it, you can still get a lot from that. OK, we're going to talk briefly about non-scheduled moderated tests, where you're, again, intercepting someone on your site as they're doing a real task. So you're getting someone who's doing something that they are already motivated to do. You're not motivating them to do it. Um, and also, there's recru reduced recruiting time, because even compared to the scheduled um, testing, which takes less time than in person, now you really don't have that time at all because you're interrupting them as they're using your site. Um, Con requires access to code. So you're going to want to install something that allows you to be um, surveying people as they're using your site. You're going to need to do something to your site in order to let that happen. And you need a lot of traffic to your site, so thousands of visits a day in order for it to be worth your time to be sitting there looking at results as they're coming in. So right now, there's, there's one tool to do this, basically, at this point. It's called Ethneo, and it's built by our friends over at Bolt Peters. Um, and it's a great tool. You only need to just install one line of JavaScript within your file. And you have a screener that you can customize on the Ethneo website that allows you to ask all sorts of demographic and you know, attitudinal questions. And people fill those out. You get those results in real time. And then if you see something that's interesting, you can ping that person. You can call them. You can, within the screener, you say, would it be OK if we call you? And if they say yes and you like them, then you pick up your phone and you call them right then. And so it happens instantaneously. So you get on the phone with them, and that's when you install your screen sharing. Yes? Did you have a question? Yes, I did. OK. Traditionally, usability testing, and I usually, for most projects, my sessions are about 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. I've never done this moderated, unscheduled. Just, what's the impact on how long you can keep that person on the phone if they haven't planned for it and you're catching them in the middle of their work day or whatever? It's about the same. I mean, you, you would ask them if they have the time to do it. And if they only have half an hour, maybe you want to talk to them for half an hour. But that's the kind of thing that you'd want to ask up front in the screener. Um, and also, you want to ask them right at the beginning of your phone call to say, this is going to be 45 minutes. Do you have 45 minutes right now? So, but yes, that's a great point. Yes? 
What's the impact on the incentive if it's an unscheduled test? So you'd want something that you can, like ideally something you can send them right away, like um, a gift certificate through email, something like that. The, the yeah, I mean, again, it depends on your audience. And if you find it really easy to recruit people for 25 bucks, then great. If you're not finding enough people who are willing to do it for 25, then you start bumping up the price. So it's a free market like anything else. Whatever it takes to get the people you need. So Ethneo is great. It's a great tool to check out. Um, Bolt Peters is also releasing a book called Remote Research. It will be out um, at some point this year from Rosenfeld Media. So be sure to check that out when it's out. Okay, so we're just going to we're just going to touch on non-scheduled and non-moderated. Um, so again, these are, you know, can be authentic tasks depending on what you're doing. Um, you you have to set this up. You have to ask. You have to use one of these tools and plug in questions that you want people to answer for you. So you kind of do that up front. Um, it reduces your recruiting time because you don't need to be contacting people individually at all. Um, but you don't have any control over your moderation sessions. You basically throw out this list of questions, and then you get this set of answers. And then you do something with those answers, right? But you still have the time it takes to write those questions. And then you have to do something with the results and come up with something cohesive and thoughtful and reasonable from that, which can be a little hard if you don't really have a greater context that would actually happen within that session. But let's look at um, a couple screenshots of Usabilla, which is one of these tools. Um, so this is a view of Usabilla that I grabbed from Mashable, where you can go in and sort of ask these default questions about things that you want for people to do on your site. You could ask them to do tasks like click on the search box. And then you see if they're able to click on the search box. And then you can have them add little annotations like, I really like this color. You know, and then you basically get a dump of all of this data, and you decide what to do with it. So, some people are saying, this is great. Well, now we don't need those pesky researchers. We can do this ourselves. Um, I think that you still need pesky researchers, even if you're doing this, because someone's got to write those questions, and someone's got to look at that data. And you're probably making that researcher's job a little bit harder if they don't have better control over those sessions. They don't know what's really happening there. And they don't really understand anyone's motivation for doing what they're doing, which is a lot of the reason why you do qualitative research. So I don't, I don't think this is going to come in and and change the whole way that we do research. I mean, if anything, it could be an interesting thing to try as well as whatever else you're doing. Um, it can be a way to maybe validate some assumptions, like, oh, I don't think people are actually seeing this box. Let's see if they're not seeing it. Um, but it's something that people are probably going to ask you about. Like, oh, well, why do we need to have you when we can go to Usabilla? You know? So think about. So that's something to think about. You know, think about what, um, as a researcher, that you still have a role within that, and that you're going to really need to be doing other research in addition to that to understand the context around user behaviors. OK, so let's jump into a couple real projects. And this is a real photo. This is not Photoshopped. I didn't take it. Um, OK, first we're going to talk about Lumos Labs. So this is an organization that I worked with that develops um, a, a platform for brain training games called Lumosity. And this allows people to do these cognitive exercises daily to help improve cognitive function. And we really wanted to understand sort of standard customer behavior. Like, what are our normal users doing every day when they come onto come on the site? Are they using the training programs? Are they checking their scores? Are they um, sharing their scores with other people? Like, what are, what are they actually doing on our site? Why are they doing this? Um, is it that different people? Are, are, are some people sharing their scores with other people? Other folks are not sharing their scores? You know, what's, what's happening there and why? So we wanted to really do some sort of broad research into the state of current customer behavior. So we recruited current customers. Um, Twitter, email, newsletter, our blog. When I sent out the screening email, I asked them for their Lumosity username. 
So if they weren't current users, they obviously wouldn't have a username. And I went in and, and just checked that against our database records before contacting them to make sure they were actually a current user. Um, much, much easier than finding in-person recruits, for sure. And it just got much greater user di diversity. We had a, a very international audience. Didn't make sense to only talk to people in San Francisco. Our users li lived all over the world. Um, so by doing remote research, we were able to connect with these people in a way that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And also, it ended up being even more useful than we thought because you're of how you're able to see how someone has their machine set up. So this is a little blurry because it's from a, a, a still from a compressed video, and I, I blurred out this woman's name. There's a lot that you can tell from this that you wouldn't have been able to tell if she'd just been in the lab. So you can see that she's using IE, that she has both the Google and Yahoo toolbars installed, um, that she's never clicked out of the alert messages that we put on the site. So once we saw a lot of people who'd never closed out of the alert messages, we realized, oh, we should probably have those auto expire after a certain amount of time. Um, I can see that she's enrolled in the basic training program. I can see that her, her BPI is 231, and I, I know sort of how that compares to the, the curve, the distribution of BPI scores, so I have some indication that, so sorry, BPI is a sort of um, made up term for how well you're able to use the site. Um, so it, it correlates to um, cognitive function, basically, so your memory, your reaction time, that kind of thing. As you improve in these different attributes, your, your, your brain performance index goes up. So you can, you can track your, uh, your training that way. So I, I know her BPI. I know how that relates to other people's. Uh, so I can get a sense for how her reaction time and memory, et cetera, is. Um, also, Lumosity points, which is basically calculating how much you use the site. So from there, I can see that, you know, how active of a user she is. You know, I can ask someone, well, how much do you use the site? But it's nice to actually be able to see that. I mean, I know that these numbers. Um, so I wouldn't have the same context about her if she had just come into the office. You know, I, this, it just lends a much more whole view of who this person is. So even though I couldn't see her face, it actually ended up being sort of more useful than it would have been face to face. So this, this was a really ongoing project. So because it was remote and it, didn't, it wasn't super hard to schedule people, this is something we did every week. We had two or three remote tests. And this way we could iterate along with an agile development cycle and keep testing new things as they were developed. And it worked out really nicely to do that. And we were able to um, pull people in on quicker notice if we had something new that we wanted to test really quickly. So the next one I want to talk about real quick is Lend Around. So this is a company that is building um, ways to share DVDs with friends. So it's in beta right now. You can go to the site and check it out. Um, I've been working with the team to really think about how they want to build the next version of the site. And so we've been doing basically formative research remotely. So this is phone only. It's only audio. It's not visual. Um, talking to people all over the country. This is a US-based study. And again, these are people that we found um, using Mechanical Turk, the people who filled out a survey, and then we called the ones who were interesting. Um, and we had some ideas about very, very specific user types. So we kind of knew who we wanted to be talking to. And we had such a, a, a pool of people because we had all these survey results that we could have very, very targeted um, conversations with people. We would not have been able to find those people through just sort of posting an ad somewhere. And this, I ended up using exactly the same setup as I've used for other studies. I did record audio. I mean, I did record video because I was recording my notes that I was typing as I was talking to the person. Um, but that isn't something I, I shared. I just shared the audio with the client. But it was a way for me to go back as I was doing analysis later on. Um, to have all that together in one place was really, really helpful. So even though I wasn't doing screen sharing, I was still using everything else ex um, 
instead of that, which made a lot of sense. So just a couple kind of quick descriptions of ways that remote studies can work. Um, so let's think about this. How would we do this? So we have another exercise. So would remote research be useful for your organization? And is there a project that you know about that would benefit from a remote component? So I assume we've kind of been thinking about this a little bit as we've gone through. Um, is there anyone that wants to share some ideas? The library where I worked until recently just instituted a new checkout system that people could re uh, access online. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other librarians were really thrilled about it. I thought there would be problems with the users. And sure enough, people started calling me and saying, how can I find this book? If we'd been able to track their screens and see where they were going wrong mm -hmm. and what was fouling them up, it would have been a huge improvement. All right, so that, um, that sounds like a case where that could have really saved some, some headaches up front then. Anyone else? We have a, uh, sorry, we have a mobile development environment, IDE, that uh, as we're running out our, our <clears throat> excuse me, our next build, uh, I'd like to get some data on, on exactly what people are looking at. Mm -hmm. Can I clarify? I, I want to make sure I understood your, your question or your, your issue. You're creating mobile apps with this development ID, but people are working on it on a static machine on a PC. They're not building on mobile. They're testing on mobile. Okay. Okay. Good. All right, so let's open this up to questions. I'm curious if you have done any remote research for a retail e-commerce type site. I have not. Have you? Yes. Any thoughts? Quick thoughts? Um, if that's a long, <laughs> there's a long answer. It's tricky. OK. Paul, I think that's another talk we should schedule. Um, I'm doing some um, iPhone development these days. and. Uh, the users have a device that can record voice, but I can't get screen I don't sharing. See, can you hold up your hand? I don't see where you are. Oh, there you Hello. are. Hello. Okay. Um, doing mobile development on iPhone, uh, being able to do user research uh, based on their stuff. Are you doing that now? Uh huh. You're doing remote research? Or you would like to do remote research? I would research? like to better would enable <laughs> our users so Call that we me can if do you remote it out. research. Okay. Okay. Um, because it's really, that's a good point, because it's really awkward to be looking around wondering who's talking to you. If you're on the phone, you know who you're talking to. But that's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. So earlier you mentioned language, but I'm curious about how you've handled or if you've handled in the past uh, testing with uh, people uh, remotely who don't speak English, and um, if no one in your organization if you want to still facilitate how you deal with interpreters and those kinds of things. Like on, um, on the fly, interpreting can be really difficult. So I haven't done that personally. Um, so Nate Bolt over at Bolt Peters has a great anecdote about how he's done, how he's tested for English language competency when doing a test in English. They were doing a study of video games with kids in South America. And they would ask them, oh, do you speak English? And they would all say, yes, I speak English. And then their next question was, OK, so what direction does a balloon go when you let it go? Okay. And then like, oh, sideways or down or up? You know, and the answer was up. But that was a sort of a real test for um, being able to speak English at that point. Um, so you want to make sure, I mean, before you take the time to call someone that you're able to talk to them and communicate with them. Um, otherwise, it's not really going to be a good use of anyone's time. Um, if you don't have, I don't think there's a great answer, basically. I mean, it's, it would be hard to do um, interpreting 
as you're doing this, it might be better just to find a moderator who's able to speak that language. So I'm wondering if anyone has done any kind of quantitative comparison of remote and in person in terms of, you know, uh, you know, run the same test in two different modalities, do you get the same success rates, same uh, usability scores, et cetera? I'm doing that right now. I don't have results for you yet, though. Two weeks, I will. Actually, we just did a uh, card sort, which was um, uh, the first eight participants were local, and we mm -hmm. did it in person. Mm -hmm. But we needed to also get participants from about five different countries. So we threw that out as an unmoderated, unscheduled uh, remote. And we actually found that there wasn't that much uh, variety in the, that much variety in the variety of answers right. with both sets of groups. Uh, oh, that's um, interesting. Groups. Okay. Hi, I have two questions. The first is, is this used only for web-based applications, or do you ever use it for software as well? Sure, you can use it for, well, it's tricky, because you, you can't have them go to it and use the software. I mean, I've done this before, where through like running a virtual environment, you have the, that person able to access your computer. Um, I haven't found great results from doing that just because it ends up being really slow and then you're looking at something that's really tiny and then you can't like resize it. And um, I haven't seen it work terribly well. I think it could work well. I just think that it hasn't really been tried much, but it certainly can be done. And the second question was, in the usability sphere, what percent is remote and do you see much acceptance from business people in using I see this. a lot of acceptance from business people because they see that it's, it can be a lot cheaper. Um, and it just sort of makes sense. I mean, once everyone gets used to having remote meetings, then this is just sort of seems like, oh, well, then we can do that too remotely, right? So I found that there hasn't been a lot of pushback on it, but I still think that the vast majority of research is done in person at this point. I, I think it's probably likely to change the next few years. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, I just have one comment about remote testing software. Yes. So I work in enterprise software. If you have a beta cycle, which I assume some companies still have, yep. this would be something you could do during a beta cycle. Yes. Because the software is already installed over there. Yep. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Karen will come up. Does he need my dongle? I'll just leave this on yeah, for him. Okay. So, <clears throat> tonight's second speaker is. <clears throat> Go ahead, Conrad. All right. Thanks. Conrad managed to walk across the street from VMware, where he's uh, working on the design of uh, new UIs. Uh, tonight's talk on uh, monitoring systems. He said it's based on his uh, dissertation research, um, where he uh, did that research was at Northwestern, and he must have been such a good student because he said that Don Norman was cuddly and lovable, and so um, that's going on record. And uh, uh, I, I'm really eager to to hear the talk. I thought it was going to be a great compliment to Julie's. And if you're ready, yeah, I'm just going to try to get the slides up, and hopefully have. Oops, that's not going to help. There we go. I'm going to borrow Julie's power supply here. All right, thank you all for uh, sticking around and for giving me a chance to talk to you uh, tonight. Um, my name is Conrad Albrecht Bueller, and I want to talk to you today uh, a little bit about how we design monitoring tools. So my problem is, is that I think monitoring UIs pretty much all stink. Um, to, to be fair, it's not that I think that they really stink, it's just that they're incomplete. Um, there's, 
I would classify all monitoring tools into basically three types based on how they're designed to draw your attention and how much information they contain. Uh, reports, for example, are, uh, they contain a lot of information. Uh, information that's focused on a subject that may contain uh, a significant amount of data analysis, um, but it's not really designed to draw your attention and so it's actually pretty easy to overlook what's in a report. By comparison, an alarm or an alert is designed to really direct your attention, but contains very little information. Typically, it just contains a single bit of information. Um, now, dashboards do actually contain a lot of, of data, which is typically unanalyzed data and is, uh, is not necessarily organized around a, a subject or a particular situation. And so I'd say it actually has a little less information than a report, but they are designed to direct your attention a little bit. So you, one way to sort of think about monitoring UIs is that they exist on this sort of continuum. And we see that there's this gap. For monitoring UIs to really be complete, we need to find or create some kind of interfaces to, to bridge this gap. And so I'm gonna try to make the argument tonight that in order to bridge this gap, what we really need are interfaces that are designed primarily to direct attention but do contain some useful information, enough to know when and what to monitor. Not what to do, but when and what to monitor. In other words, when to use those dashboards and reports that we've got. To make my case, I'm gonna tell you three stories, uh, real user stories, about monitoring and the difficulties each user had. I'll discuss the, the situations that are important to each of them, and I'll tell you how each of them perform their particular monitoring activity. Uh, each story is gonna be an example of a monitoring task that has to compete with a whole bunch of other responsibilities and is one for which alarms or dashboards don't totally work. The first story is gonna be about monitoring servers. The second story is gonna be one about uh, monitoring business performance by reading financial reports. And the last story is gonna be about monitoring a user's experience within a discussion forum. Our first story is gonna be about the CTO who works in a small startup. Uh, the, the company's business is focused on uh, a website where, where users come to, to use a service. And in addition to his technical duties like fundraising and, and doing interviews, he's responsible for all technical aspects of the company. That means that he's the lead developer of the web application, and, it, and so he's in charge of that team. And he's also the primary sysadmin. He's in charge of building all the desktops, all the servers, and maintaining all of them. As part of his, um, his sysadmin duties, he's gotta uh, keep a close eye on the performance of his web servers, his mail servers, and his uh, database servers. To do that, he actually has these very powerful dashboards, but in fact, he rarely ends up using them. I mean, his dashboards sort of look a lot like this one, and there's a great, wonderful amount of information here. There's even more here as we go down, and up. Oh, there's still some more, and wait, I think that's, wait, is that it? Oh, oh, there's more, okay, there we go. That's, so why wouldn't our, our CTO use these dashboards? I mean, it, sure looks like there's a great deal of fantastic data. The problem is, is that our CTO has a whole lot of other responsibilities besides monitoring, and skimming and interpreting these dashboards takes time. So he's, he's not an air traffic controller, so who can, you know, who can primarily focus on his monitoring task. But maybe there's something that we can learn from, from those air traffic controllers. Um, Air, air traffic controllers do focus most of their attention, but they have this multitude of information they have to manage. So they and the designers that build their tools rely on this concept that I'm sure probably everybody here is familiar with called situation awareness. Um, and Micah Ensley has done a mountain of work in situation awareness and gives us sort of this canonical definition of it. Um, but for today, I, I prefer Jeannot, Kelly, and Thompson's uh, definition, which is what, just what you need to know not to be surprised. And in that definition are sort of the, the 
three kernel ideas of situation awareness. That you want to help the, the user attend to information that's relevant to a goal. That you want to help them interpret that information to get at its meaning. And then eventually help them to make a forecast. So this is sort of the very high level description of what situation awareness is. And if you want to learn more, I, I really highly recommend um, Micah Inslee and her uh, co-author's book called uh, Designing for Situation Awareness, An Approach to User-Centered Design. It's great. She has like 90 or so great recommendations on, on how to design for situation awareness. So, but dashboards can, so and for situation awareness, dashboards can actually sometimes help us interpret the data, uh, the meaning of data. And when they include time domain data, uh, like these graphs, they actually can help us make forecasts. Um, and Stephen Few and, and Edward Tufte, of course, have written great books about, about this topic. But even a well-designed dashboard requires mental effort to parse to find the information relevant to a goal. And this is more an issue of grouping information than it is of highlighting information within the dashboard. Oh, Maybe these elements together sort of explain a particular, help, uh, help the user identify a particular situation that's important to them, like the, that the server's been compromised, that their application is bottlenecking, um, that the network's misconfigured. Um, but it, we can use this sort of knowledge now that we have from, from situational awareness to, to at least come up with a couple of small design goals. Um, at least to try to reduce the mental effort required to parse the monitoring UI is a good high-level goal for designing interfaces to support situation awareness. And perhaps even customization and filtering of the, of the data displayed uh, to buy each situation that's relevant to the user. These aren't really lofty design goals, and, and there are plenty of dashboards that actually let you do this. Even um, uh, Google Analytics lets you do that. Um, and so it's, it's a good start. But so let's go back to talking about our CTO. So if he's not using dashboards to monitor his servers, what is he using? Well, he works on his servers all day long. He works on the machines um, all, the, all the time, you know, updating application code, installing patches, et cetera. And I noticed that when he logs into any of these servers, before he logs out, he runs uptime on the server's load and takes a look at that. Does everybody know what uptime does? It just it tells you just how loaded the server has been in the last minute, two minutes, and five minutes, I believe. Um, and so he samples the server load based on convenience when he happens to be logged in. And if he happens to catch a moment of high server load, and if he's got time, he might go investigate the situation. In other words, what he's saying is that the, the, if the server load is high enough, he, uh, that uh, he's asking whether or not the server load is high enough for him to go investigate. So high enough. What's high enough? I, that's pretty subjective. What might be high enough to me isn't necessarily high enough for him. He's making a subjective, excuse me, he's making a subjective evaluation from this objective information. And so, but if this is what he actually does to monitor, make decisions about when to monitor, maybe we should support that, support making those sort of subjective evaluations. But implicit in his question of whether or not it's high enough for him to go monitor is the question of whether or not he has enough time to go investigate it. Remember, he has a whole lot of other responsibilities. So really the question he's asking is, is it important enough for me to go investigate? So that's the that's a question that helps identify when he should go monitor. Um, and this is the cornerstone of how I think we can improve monitoring UIs. We need another kind of monitoring UI that tells us that there's something important enough for us to begin actively monitoring. Now, doesn't that sound suspiciously a lot like an alarm? I mean, couldn't our CTO just use an alarm to tell him that the server load was high enough? Uh, in the beginning, I mentioned that alarms were actually another kind of monitoring UI, um, but alarms have their own set of problems. You never know that they're coming. And when they force you to act even when you can't. And if you can't address them in the moment, what do you do about them? Do you cancel them and forget that they went off? Do you just ignore them and let them continue to try to draw your attention? Or do you snooze them for how long? What happens when it goes off again? You're in the same boat you were before. 
And in fact, our CTO has alarms um, that tell him about these sorts of incidents, but he mostly ignores those too. Um, he filters them into their own <laughs> email box and he never looks at them. The only time he looks at them is when he's actually discovered that something is wrong and he uses them to try to figure out what the root cause was by going back and looking for the first alarm or the early alarms. Now, to be fair and to be honest, he does actually use one alarm regularly. Sometimes he gets, he, someone from his customer, some customer support team comes and finds him and tells him that they're getting angry calls. So you could say he's basically using his customers as his alarm system, but obviously that's not ideal. So let's look a little more closely at why the alarm doesn't quite work for his um, uptime monitoring method. So here's a quick graph of server load. Um, so is it high enough? Is the load high enough for him to go investigate? I don't know, to me, if it was under 0.9, I, I probably wouldn't care. But to him, it's anything above 0.7, that's a serious issue. So you could set an alarm threshold. But the problem with, with using, alarm is the, uh, using the alarm, as I mentioned before, is that he won't necessarily have time when it goes off to do anything about it. And when he does have time, he doesn't know anything. It doesn't tell him anything unless it happens to go off right then. Uh, the root of the problem is that this is what an alarm does. It divides the data range into the data that he should ignore and the data that he should pay attention to. Now, remember, he said that he'd investigate if the load was high enough. All that an alarm does is tell him that it's high. And what's more, it only tells him that once it's happened. And so he doesn't know anything beforehand. Now, this is where a graph would really do us a lot of good. Um, he could see how it was changing, and he could see where it is and where it's been, but at a cost. Um, he has to interpret the graph, and that was already the reason why he wasn't using his dashboards to begin with. Furthermore, uh, graphs, though useful, take up a ton of screen real estate. And it's why, for the most part, um, network operation centers look like this with monitors as far as the eye can see. Um, and our CTO can't afford to do that in his small startup. So maybe there's something in between a graph and an alarm that we could come up with that might help him. So instead, what if we change uh, how the data range is divided up from this to this? Instead of showing the whole graph, we could just show that region prior to the alarm threshold. Then the position of the data within the region could identify the importance of attending to the situation. If the data is below that ignore threshold, it might as well be at the ignore threshold. And once it's crossed the attend threshold, you should go pay attention to it, but it might as well be at the attend threshold. It doesn't matter how high it goes. Um, well, I, so the range in between enables us to indicate that there's this degree of importance to attending to the situation. Um, for lack of a better term, I refer to the range as heed. Um, the closer it gets to the alarm threshold, the more important it becomes to pay attention to it. So, and we can then just apply a familiar slider widget to um, indicate the heat. And now our, our CTO has a way of knowing if the load is high enough. Now we can offer him a simple dashboard that, that relies on the way he already monitors his servers. One that doesn't give him too much detail and can still help him decide if he should turn his attention to his servers depending on how much time he has. Uh, in other words, it sort of helps him make tactical decisions about his time. And it does so continuously if the, the display is somehow up and persistent. Um, and given that it's small, there's probably room for it and he doesn't need a whole network operation center. Um, uh, but in the case of this situation, that these are all indicated by single sensors. Uh, a lot of situations that are important to monitor for are, uh, are indicated by lots of different sensors together. That was that whole problem of grouping in a dashboard. And this is also a situation that he has to check on several times a day. What about situations that we care about, that we want to monitor for, that happen far, far less frequently? So to that end, let me tell you about a, a CEO that I, that I work with who had a very different monitoring problem. Um, she's in charge of a medium-sized company that also has a, 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 a that was primarily based around a web service. Um, and, and Recently, she's launched uh, several programs to grow that business. 
And she needs to keep her eye on how those uh, programs are performing because they cost her money and, and they need to bring in a certain amount of money. They basically need to perform well. But she, just like our CTO, it also has way too many responsibilities. Um, and something that's more immediately urgent keeps coming up. And so it's really easy for her to put this off. She only needs to check in on the performance of these programs maybe once a week. They don't change that, for, that fast. But given that she has all these other things to do, and given the fact that she's actually quite anxious about their performance, she's not that likely to go look in on it. And sure enough, she didn't. And she stopped looking at it for months, only to discover sometime much later that the programs have been seriously underperforming. Um, so she, she monitors these programs by, uh, by reading reports that are generated for her that more or less look like this. Um, if the reports show that the program uh, is not performing well enough, then she's going to pay closer attention to it. She's going to do something to go investigate it. Um, and in many ways, this is a lot like our CTO's problem um, of, of monitoring servers, except that the, the values change way more slowly. So at least we can try to apply a similar solution first. So here we could see how close each of our clients are to being underperformers. Now we could just show her these four indicators. Um, and but what happens when this program grows from four customers to 20, to 200? We need some way to collapse this, this or compact this display so she can just decide to read the report. Because reading the report is really her monitoring task. So we want to indicate when it's useful for her to monitor. So let's, let's try to figure out a way to, to compact the display. Um, we'll start by assigning just some values to the, the scale, maybe make uh, zero for the minimum heed and one for the maximum heed. Now what we could do is just elect the maximum value of any of the, the customers to sort of act as a stand-in for the report, to act as sort of a summary of the report. What that means is that instead of saying the client M needs your attention now, um, it says that the report needs her attention now. And it says that unless the whole program is performing well, she should probably go investigate the situation. This might look familiar to some of you. This is essentially an OR operation from uh, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy SEP theory um, applied to heat values. And, but now she does have the single uh, representation that summarizes her whole report and helps her make a decision about whether or not to, to uh, uh, monitor that report closely. Now if we, again, make it persistently visible, she can have a continuous evaluation of, of the program's performance. And if it looks like the program might need her attention, she can first delve into the display and get some more detailed evaluation. And then if something looks, as something concerns her, she can dive in even more and see the real data herself. Um, you know, we can sort of think of, you know, that's obviously our um, beloved uh, progressive disclosure. Um, we can use this model actually for describing how uh, heed UIs should uh, direct user attention present them with a subjective evaluation of the information, and then move them slowly toward more detailed objective analysis, um, sort of essentially going from Simon to House. Um, so this sort of offering more detail on demand is obviously something that we've all uh, come to know and love and is, is certainly useful, would be useful here as well. Um, now, some of the situations that people monitor for aren't because they're already familiar with them, but it's because they want to learn about them. The next monitoring story I want to tell you about is about the sole developer and admin for a community-oriented website. So his site is co-located, so he doesn't really need to worry about the, the condition of the servers. That's somebody else's problem. But what he cares about is uh, whether or not his users are having a good experience in the forum, or at least not having a bad experience. So he talked to me about two types of negative experiences that he wanted to keep, uh, that he already keeps track of or tries to look out for. Uh, the first is something restricting access for his users to the website. And the second is the discussion on the site becoming what he called unbalanced. So first let me figure out, what, let me tell you about what he meant by access restriction. Um, since he's the sole developer of the site, he's frequently changing the source code. 
Um, and he's had the experience where a small typo, a small error, meant that some of his users couldn't log in, but not all of them. And likewise, he had a similar experience when he had made another error and some users couldn't post. And so he wanted to keep an eye out for some sort of change in the activity to figure out whether or not he'd made a similar mistake. And so he described the situation that he was paying attention to as to one when people weren't logging in or when they couldn't post or reply. Despite the fact that I said or there a whole bunch of times, this actually amounts to an and operation um, of the numbers of posts and replies. Not a, a logical and, but really what's called a compensatory measure. Um, the reason is because if some of the, if uh, it could, there could be a day where uh, there's a whole lot of posting activity and no reply activity, which could mean that he's made some error in the code that's prevented replies. So maybe he should look in on it. Um, but certainly, if people can't post and can't reply, then he should definitely look in on it. But he also mentioned this thing about unbalanced. Um, so what he meant by unbalanced was he wanted, he wanted the forums to be a place where conversation was always conducive. And he, he, he called, he, what he meant by unbalanced was when there were suddenly too many posts and too many replies, that there basically was such a hot topic or there was so much argument going on that new users couldn't, would feel like they couldn't join in. And the other thing he wanted to look out for were too many what he called dud posts, where someone would post and nobody would reply to it. He said that that would make it feel like the forum was sort of a dead place where there wasn't anything going on. And so he wanted to look out for that. But he didn't actually know how many posts or replies or dud posts would constitute an unbalanced forum. He had no, never spent any real time with the data, and so he, he didn't know, but he, wanted to, but he wanted to learn. The only time he knew to, to moderate was when he would check in from time to time and he would see what sort of felt like there were too many dud posts or there were, too, uh, uh, there were too many posts and replies, there was too much activity. That's when he would step in and moderate. So he needed some way to actually modify his, his, uh, his interpretation of the data. So we started out with a very conservative estimate and then enabled him to modify the evaluation. Now, um, so he would be able to take a look at the indicated heed and then just simply drag it to where he thought it needed to go. Now, uh, this actually just amounts to um, moving the thresholds. So uh, if you drag the, the little slider down, that's really the same thing as moving the ignore boundary up. And, and so it's a very trivial, simple sort of learning um, system, sort of. Um, but in this way, he could adjust his evaluation until it became more consistent with his own experience. He could then go look at how, what the, the thresholds were actually in, the, in, his, in his configuration files, and he started to actually become familiar with the data, and, he, and by watching the forums like this, he actually learned a whole lot about his, how his users actually interacted. So, so this is uh, more of what I meant about um, including subjective evaluation and monitoring tools. The information that monitoring tools present must reflect the personal knowledge of the user looking at it. And their knowledge is constantly changing, so it's, it, we have to somehow support this uh, frequent revision of the information that is being displayed to them. But since he too has a whole lot of duties, and because moderating the forum takes a whole lot of time, um, he, needed more in, uh, in, he, needed to, he needed more information to make these sort of tactical decisions about his time. What he really needed to know was how the situation was changing. So this is where that graph really comes in handy. Um, but again, we don't need to show him the whole graph. We, just need, we can clip the data at the thresholds and just show him the region in between. Um, but we also don't need a whole lot of detail. It doesn't really matter if there are 36 or 33 posts. So we can downsample the data. And this gives us a much simplified graph. And this goes hand in hand with the design recommendation to show detail on demand. Start with a minimum amount of necessary detail. Precision is not necessary for evaluation. So the, the display he ended up with um, now shows him the recent history of the situation, which tells him how the situation is changing. And it enable, therefore, it actually enables him to sort of make a forecast of how the data is going to change. And we could show him that forecast more explicitly if we use a, a 
common filter, which is just a way of, of sort of guessing how it's changing based on how it's already changed. And so we can show him this forecast sort of more explicitly. Um, and so this widget displays heed, time, and occupancy likelihood. Um, and, but the problem is that this display still has one small problem, which is that the current state is not entirely obvious. The center line is the now, and so it would be the data point right before it. But really, we want him to not spend any time interpreting. He wants, we want to get it as close to as short uh, an interpretation as possible. So we modified the display to be more compact and really highlight the current evaluation. Um, let's see, where did my cursor go? Uh, this, this animation shows the relationship between the graph view and its corresponding slider view. Um, the, the slider view is intended to sort of convey motion, sort of like motion lines from comics. And these are the two corresponding graph and slider views uh, sort of to, to show their relationship. I don't have a really, I don't know what to call them, so I call them a gizmometer widget. Um, but so to monitor a situation with heed, the, the first thing we've got to be able to do is, is uh, help the user identify and describe the situation that's of interest to them uh, in terms of indicative conditions. And remember that that's actually how our users use their dashboards. They, they, spot, or they, they try to spot conditions and try to figure out what those conditions indicate. Um, next, we want a, a way for them to quickly perceive the situation in order to, to uh, make a quick evaluation. Has the situation occurred? Is it likely to occur soon and, and how soon? Then we want to give them a way to investigate, to, to delve in and analyze the information. And finally, we want to enable them to refine and modify the situation to better reflect their, their changing understanding or their, the, the changing environment underneath. So I've tried to make the argument tonight that, that what we need are, are interfaces that are designed primarily to direct attention and still contain some information, in particular, situationally relevant information, enough to know what to monitor and when. Now, not to replace alarms or dashboards or report, but to work in conjunction with all of them. And hopefully sort of following these, these design goals that I identified along the way and in light of the, the user goals I laid out, I'm, I, I believe we can create um, additional interfaces that, that better integrate monitoring into our users' busy daily work lives. Um, so thanks for sticking around and, and for giving me a chance to, to talk quickly to you. Um, uh, it's been a real honor. Um, do we, we have time for questions, I guess? Uh, hey, Conrad, yeah. you work for VMware right now, correct? That's right. Um, is Gizmo Meter a separate company, a project? What, can you kind of give us some I of just, the That's just what I named the thing. Okay. I just didn't know what okay. else to name the widget. Okay. The scale is heed, but I, I needed to come up with an example UI that, that utilized this, this heed, it. and so I just came, that was just the name I came up with. How does or VMware borrowed. take advantage of what you're doing here? I mean, you know, what do they do with it? I mean, is it, is it, is it something they put in their products? Is it, is it a consulting project? How does it, how does it get related to the, your company? I, I can't really talk about ah. things the company does. Okay, I'm no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, first, uh, let me thank you for an excellent talk, and <laughs> let me suggest that you could take the work that you've done here and apply it in a different situation. Uh, let's say that you're uh, monitoring a portfolio of bonds and you're concerned about uh, one of the bond issuers uh, suddenly going bankrupt, uh, like Enron or, mm -hmm. or uh, WorldCom, or I could go on, but I think you get the point. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great idea. <laughs> it would certainly help. I had a question about just the evolution of these interfaces, and um, I guess your dissertation research was about designing these interfaces to suit the environments. And given the design principles that you have, do you think that there's some way to automatically extract interfaces that map on, or is there still a lot of design work in tailoring the interface to the information stream? 
Um, I mean, I, th I think that's certainly the, the holy grail that a lot of people look for, but I have to be honest that I, I have immense faith in designers and uh, the, the brilliant minds of designers. So I can't ever imagine an automated system coming up with any sort of interface that's anywhere nearly as good as what a designer can do. I think empathy and sympathy are powerful design tools that an, no automated system can fully um, take advantage of. And yet, we assume that some kind of a designer, presumably maybe with empathy and sympathy, made that horrible dashboard interface. <laughs> and what, I'm, what I want to know is... extensive, not horrible. Yeah. What I want to know is um, what... No, it was horrible. It was horrible. I'm, I'm sorry if you're here. It was horrible. Because it has uh, an overload of information that is uh, designed not to be read. Uh, and that has too much summary and too much data at the same time, right? Health red. Okay, mm -hmm. great. What, what makes the health red? And here are thousands of lines of data. Why would you defend the dashboard and say that we still need the dashboard? Well, I'll, um, the, uh, well the, yeah, the, I love that health is red but availability is green and that the most prominent thing is this green availability thing despite that health is critical. Um, but the, the reason I would defend the dashboard is that it's information like this and this and this that helps us analyze a situation once we've identified that it, it warrants investigation. These are powerful analytical tools, but I feel that we need something that's actually more subjective, something that's evaluative, um, if I'm allowed to sort of use that term. That, um, and so the, the heat displays, I think, are closer to an uh, evaluative uh, interface that sort of guides initial attention, but this provides us with the ability to analyze the, the situation once we've identified it as being worth our attention. Hi, um, I've been working on a design problem that's similar to the CTO or the display that you have up there at the moment. It's for um, HVAC operators with monitoring displays and um, you work with the heat stuff's fantastic, but one of the real problems that we've had is that the operators don't actually then know how to take that data or make informed decisions from it. Mm -hmm. So even if we give them the data to say this is um, you know, all the surrounding information, how do then we build in domain knowledge into interfaces? And mm. I was wondering if you had any advice on that. Well, actually, that's a, a perfect example of why it's so valuable to have subjective interfaces. If we provide the user with the information they should be paying attention to, but they're not, they're, they're not yet educated enough to know what to do with it, we're giving them useless information, or at, at, at best and at worst, we're actually making the situation uh, anxious for them and, and scaring them. That's why it's necessary for an in, the individual to essentially create the, the, the evaluation or have access to the individual. It would be fine if they could, the, those individuals could then ask an expert when they're told that something's going on, that something is broken, and then sort of get at that expert knowledge. Okay, so these are all fully customizable interfaces. Mm -hmm. Hi, I think um, this has been a great talk. Um, I've designed many dashboards and monitoring systems, and I think you made a really good point of distinguishing between monitoring, which is something that's got to be a low cognitive con effort to just see if something's okay, and analysis, which is what a dashboard is usually more mm -hmm. for. And I think it'd be very nice to see a use of your gizmometer on dashboards, because a lot of dashboards you want to start on a high-level page, which it says, things are okay, you can just get an idea, and then, oh, it's getting close, you click, you go in, and you get your tables and charts and whatnot. Yeah, I think it's a nice combination. Thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate that. So I, um, I spent many years working for companies that did the interfaces for the network operation centers that are not the case you were talking about. But, um, with a lot of customization, you could have an interface where you had summary information and then drilled down and drilled down and drilled down. And, and also, intel more uh, systems with a certain amount of dependency information built in and intelligence built in that allowed you to uh, determine the significance of an alarm rather than just displaying a million alarms. Yeah. So the, you know, I'm not sure that everybody here understands that those systems exist in these large organizations. What you're talking about is that is really a different case. Yeah, a, you know, a, a much a, a, a case where uh, you 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 just can't have that kind that level of 
That, yeah, absolutely. There are certain, there are great you know examples in in, in nuclear power plants and in, in huge manufacturing plants where the events occur so much faster than humans can even respond. That that there there have to be automated systems that actually um, uh, roll up alarms and stuff. But alarm roll up is actually a big problem. Um, and there's a great study by I think it was. Um, uh, Bainsbury, Bransbury in the UK, their health and safety uh, administration that looked at, at, at all sorts of alarm problems in, in production and in big production environments. And this was one of the big problems that they saw that when alarms get rolled up that they would, they would obscure sometimes the problem because it'd be a f problem in the roll up. Um, but actually one of the things that you sort of pointed out here is that it, we, it puts this new burden on the designer to make it easy to uh, author to sort of author these these situation descriptions that there's it, it, it's got to be easy for the, the user to make adjustments and I'm hoping that sort of that direct way of, of adjusting is, is helpful but even just authoring those situations has to be done easily um, I ended up doing the authoring for um, two of these cases but actually that um, the forum owner took the, the code, just he started writing his own. He, you know, he had the configuration file, he started writing his own to start monitoring all different sorts of things in his, his environment that he wanted to learn about. And so if we can make it, it, but it does put this new burden on us to actually write good authoring as, along with um, good monitoring tools. Thank you very much. Thanks.